Hey. Good morning, everyone. Uh, you're all awake? <laughs> um, good. Anyway, um, welcome to the uh, pipeline presentation of Spring. This is really a first here because um, this is a little bit, little bit more technical than I normally get, and maybe this is also not my area of expertise, but I'll try to explain it as best as I can. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Andy, I, I work at Blender, and uh, in April we made a film, well in April we published a film, we <laughs> premiered a film <laughs> called Spring. And uh, yeah, we made it over the course of a year at the Blender Institute, Animation Studio, and uh, yeah, we published it in April. And um, for, for me this was really a first, because uh, like this was actually the first film I was really directing. And uh, I had a number of other tasks during the production, so I was not only like scrambling to, to make this a good film, but uh, I was also doing lighting, and um, I also did environment modeling, and I did the occasional matte painting for the film, and uh, I did a lot of simulation for it, and uh, some rigging for the simulation, like the hair for spring, um, hair grooming was also a lot of fun to do. Uh, shot assembly, which ended up eating most of my time, um, and that's actually most of what this talk is also going to be. And uh, finally, some occasional rig fixes, you know, because we didn't have, have our rigger in house, and some things needed to be fixed. But also, the animator has had to be had to do <laughs> rig fixes. So, yeah, and, and finally, grading. So, um, there's there's a, a a big number of things that I was I was fortunate enough to get my hands on, and uh, that was really cool because I could uh, you know look into all these different areas of, of filmmaking, and uh, yeah, this is why I'm giving this presentation because I want to share that with you guys, and uh, we'll see. So, <laughs> filmmaking is. Uh, is, is really complex, and uh, for a short film, it's it's a little bit simpler. But you still have to do like all the all these steps to uh, to get to the final product. Um, and uh, how do you do those things? And how does everything get get together? Um, if you uh, if you read up some of that stuff on the internet, you get a lot of simplified versions of it. You know, there's this pipeline thing, and and the word pipeline suggests that uh, filmmaking is really a, a linear you know, a linear operation. You go from the from the first concepts to the storyboards, and then you make an animatic, and then you end up somewhere with the final film. It's really not like that. Um, more, it's more like a lot of things overlap during the whole production. So, um, a lot of departments have to work with each other, and they have to communicate. That's uh, that's a very big challenge of filmmaking, and um, the. The pipeline is really there to just facilitate that, to help people to communicate with each, with each other. And uh, on the most fundamental level, it's about uh, you know putting all the stuff together. So the putting all the stuff together is what this is about. And uh, I don't have enough time to show you everything because you could literally give an entire conference about the things that we learned during this production. Um, but yeah, here we go. Um, Another thing is like what, what makes us as the Blender Animation Studio different from the rest, apart from the fact that we use Blender. Um, for Spring, we used Blender 2.8. We switched um, during you know, halfway through the production to Blender 2.8, and uh, that was really wild because uh, like everything was super nice and cozy, Blender 2.79, and then yeah, we had to like port our entire workflow to Blender 2.8. Uh, while it was being developed, and that was uh, that was super challenging, and those that also influenced the entire way that the film was being made uh, in many ways. Um, another thing is, of course, that we are an open source studio, so we try to be very open about everything, and we want to make sure that we use open source software for filmmaking because uh, we don't think that like filmmaking making should be limited to you know big studios that that can afford to push all this money through development of you know, stuff. So we try to, well, we use Blender for almost everything. And there is some 2D work that has to be done in uh, Krita, Inkscape, GIMP, and that kind of stuff. And uh, then there's other open source tools that we use and we develop as well. Um, 
The next thing, the next challenge is that we don't have a really big team. Like for Spring, it wasn't really like we had a, a well, not a handful of people, but a bit more than a handful of people to make this film. And uh, that means that a lot of people have to do a lot of different tasks. Like you could see from my first slide, like everyone had to, uh, had to engage in a number of things that they weren't originally uh, you know, planning to do. But uh, sometimes you just have to put out the fires in the places where they get started. And uh, uh, a big thing was also that we didn't have a full-time TD on this project. Like we had a lot of really great developers on this project uh, who were like really uh, like putting all their energy in, uh, into Blender 2.8. And the filmmaking aspect of, the, of that uh, was like sometimes on the sidelines because you know you you want to like you want to do all this great stuff with Blender, but uh, but you know sometimes you can't put like. You can't, you can't do everything. So um, that's also where the, the pipeline kind of ended up being very you know, manual, very grungy, very, very down to earth, because a lot of the things that we would uh, otherwise automate, we, we couldn't, because there was simply no time for it. That's maybe what you'll see here. Uh, another big thing is, is that we, like, we pu publish everything on the Blender Cloud as we go. So during spring, we had Friday weekly, uh, Friday weeklies, that's the right name. Um, and uh, then on Monday, when we all got back into the office, we, uh, we published it on the Blender Cloud. So it was out there immediately for people to see. And uh, we, we uh, gathered this huge uh, you know, library of all the concept arts and uh, uh, the work in progress shot, like the, uh, on a shot by shot basis, the work in prog progress of the film it was really cool, but it also just exposed us for a lot of. Uh, you know, input, and of course you want to follow everyone's uh, advice, you know, make sure that, uh, that you're not doing anything stupid. So that was also really challenging. So uh, let's figure out how to, how to make a film. So I think the, the most important thing for me, uh, the most down-to-earth thing for me <laughs> to start with is where do I put everything, right? Um, so where do we put everything in the studio? It's kind of a little bit of a twofold thing. Like, it's a bit more complicated than that, of course, but for us artists, we, we basically have to worry about two things. So we have our, our own hard drives, and those uh, house the production repository of Spring. This is where we store uh, all the things that make up the film, um, and that's on the hard disk. Uh, it's uh, managed by a versioning tool called uh, Subversion. It's uh, fairly old. It handles binary uh, diffing really well, so that's why we still use it. Um, and the artists uh, uh, commit and uh, get updates from that SVN. And then we also have the shared storage, which uh, I will just refer to it as slash render, because that's how we call it in the studio. And that's where all the big stuff ends up being. I'll get into a bit more detail. So this is the, this is the most important folders of the Spring repository. We have libraries, uh, we have uh, you know, the, the edit there, we have all the, the shots and the scenes and the, the tools. We put that all in those very important folders. And the libraries, there are, uh, um, we, we put more folders for characters, for props, for environment assets, um, uh, for the sets. Uh, can't read that actually. Uh, <laughs> uh, some extra notes and then maps for generalized textures. And characters, we have subfolders for each character. So that's where the actual blend files for the characters end up being. It's usually a, a big mess of files, but there's a main file, for example, spring.blend, where you find the character um, as, as a collection. And we have maps, which are specific to the, that character. Um, it's similar a bit in props. So uh, you have maps again, just for the individual props, and uh, this is where all the props end up being. Um, this is actually not props. Yeah, the notes are really small. Maybe I should look there. Ah, um, what I just said. <laughs> sets. This is where we store all the sets, and uh, then there's a bunch of other things. Edit contains the main edit. I'll uh, go back to that later, and uh, notes. Uh, we, we store some general node setups there. Uh, tools are tools specific to that production, scripts, add-ons, and that kind of stuff. The main thing is scenes. Uh, scenes 
uh, contains all the shot structure of the films. And in subfolders there, we manage uh, how the different uh, scenes come together and the shots within those scenes. I'll get to that later also. So on the other side of things, for the big data storage, we have slash render. So it's, uh, it's all about, you know, this is where the caches go. This is where the final frames go. Uh, we have uh, shots and frames, which are kind of similar. Frames is more like the render farm output. So all the raw, raw stuff from our internal farm gets dumped there. And then shots is where it gets cleaned up later on and everything gets nicely put together so we can refer it uh, for the rest of the process. Uh, we have plates for uh, background plates that get to be re-rendered and, uh, and, uh, and used in an individual shots. And uh, export is where always the latest version of the film is if there is a change. So each Friday we will render an export. But I'll get to that later. So these are the two things that uh, we as artists have to worry about in the studio. These are the, the two locations that we mainly uh, interface with. And uh, how, those, how this interfacing actually works, I'll explain that in the course of this presentation. <coughs> Let's get to actual production. So um, uh, you've seen this earlier, and uh, it's a bit simplified, because I, I don't include everything of the whole production process. Like, uh, concept art is not in there. And some of this stuff, uh, like uh, ca character development, might be even before the storyboarding starts, or some of this stuff might be in different order. But um, the main thing um, to take away from this is that uh, you have basically two things here. You have one thing that goes on during the entire production, and that's uh, asset production. So you're developing all the things that you put into the shots later on. And uh, then you have shot production, which is more uh, of a cyclic thing is the cyclic operations because you have many different shots. In spring we had uh, 102. And uh, you, you just go through these things and uh, it, re it repeats a lot because for each shot you need to set it up again and then you need to link stuff. So uh, a lot of cycles happening there. Um, <clears throat> let's start with the first bit. So how did we do the storyboarding for spring? Um, storyboarding is uh, you know, a very versatile process. We've seen a, a lot of great work uh, by Tangent Animation, uh, like how they do, how they you know, work their magic with grease pencil and everything. For us, um, all the tools were still in development, and uh, we were a bit uncomfortable with it because we're not storyboard artists per se. So our storyboards were done in post-it notes. <laughs> And uh, we really we, we started out using grease pencil and a number of other things, uh, but it was it really became uh, too much of a thing that you know you have to worry about how the tools work and that kind of stuff, and that was really getting in the way. So for us, the best communication tool was just to put the stuff on the wall, um, because also it was uh, it was me, Chalti, and Pablico, our animator. Uh, who are putting these storyboards together, so wildly ran like a wild range of different styles. Um, but we, we had to communicate about it, and post-its were really the best way. Um, we then scanned those in batches of, uh, on A4 paper. We cropped them, and we put them in the Blender sequencer. And this is how we put the first version of the film together. This is how the first animatic was born. Um, and this is also how uh, the, the, the genesis of the edit.blend Edit.blend contains the entire edit of the film during the entire production, and it changes over the course of the production, of course, and things shift and uh, you move things around. But, uh, but yeah, it's always your film. You always have a film to look at, and it'll come back during this presentation. So this is how the first animatic was, was, was born. It was really a crude thing with really crude sound effects, but it helped you know, getting our minds around this thing because it's a really complicated thing. It's very good to, even at the simplest, in the simplest form, to have a version of a film at, the, you know, at every time of the production. While that's going on, there's also character development. And I, like, I could go on and on and on about character development. Um, it's really important, and it's uh, currently our focus at the studio also with the rain, uh, the rain rig and the rain tutorials, tutorials to uh, make this process better. And uh, it's, it's a really, uh, it's a, like a time-consuming process, and it's the most important thing because like your character is the main focus in the, in the entire story. It's how you connect with it. 
and uh, it's so important. So there's a lot of back and forth between concept artists, modelers, sculptors, textures, animators, and riggers, and that goes on during the entire production. Uh, and it ends at the very end of the production when the last frame is rendered. Um, so it's, it's immensely complicated, and uh, yeah. The second most important thing I would say is props, because in, in spring we had a lot of props that were actually related to the characters, and uh, those, we also started fairly early, might be a bit wrong here, but uh, we started them fairly early because, you know, our staff, uh, the, uh, the, the chimes and other things were really important to the story, and that goes on also to the end. Um, and props are usually the things that are, uh, uh, that are, you know, objects, but they can still be rigged because they need to be animated um, um, by people, and they also need to, you know, be constrained to the characters. So um, they're the second most important thing because they're also there on the screen and they move and everything. So layout. After storyboarding is done, Again, this is very simplified, but after storyboarding is done, you want to get a three-dimensional sense of how the movie looks like. And layout is really the best thing because you're really mocking up how everything looks like uh, in 3D. And you get a lot of clues about you know, where to place the cameras and how sets are built and that kind of stuff. For us, the layouts were really uh, made in, in big files, like one blend file per scene. And all the edits within that blend file were done with camera markers. So we would put, place the markers and then put in <laughs> a lot of cameras in the scene uh, to edit the film together and to, to find a way to put the storyboard on the screen. And of course, that would also get put into the edit. <clears throat> so you see that there's you know, very crude animation, a lot of uh, skiing dogs. And, uh, yeah, but it's really, it really just helps to you know, put everything together. And uh, the <laughs> I always think that's funny. Anyway, um, while, while, while the, uh, the layout is in progress, it's also, it's also a very good tool to get your sense, or, uh, your mind around um, how, like, what this movie is made out of, like all the, the different assets that need to be put into the shots, like all the things we need. Uh, we need trees, we need rocks, we need uh, plants, we need icicles and all those things. Like at that point, uh, it starts to dawn on you what kind of uh, work you need, to be, uh, you need to be putting into this. So this is uh, also where slowly we start to work on an asset library because uh, it's, it's very, uh, it can be very mind-numbing to you know, think of the whole movie as this very like, complex shot-by-shot -shot thing. But if you have a library of, of stuff that you can just bash together, uh, it, it's, it's a bit easier, you know? So library work started really early on. Uh, Julian did a lot, like d he modeled the entire film, basically. Um, so it, it also goes on during the entire production because something is never finished. If you have, once you have a good library or you have some assets, you can start putting the sets together. And sets are really the background for each shot. And uh, in, in the set file, like for example here in the set file, uh, we link all the, the assets from the environment asset library. So, um, you know, n nothing ever gets appended or so, it's all, it's all just a reference. Um, set building usually starts from the layout. So uh, in, in layout, you get a rough sense of how everything is, you know, put together, laid out. And uh, we start from, like, from the ground planes and some rough models we made during layout, and then we put them into the set files, and then we detail them or we replace things. Uh, we put collections and we place assets. Uh, one of the most important things uh, during that time is, uh, is ground contact. Um, because um, over the course of the production, you might be working on the set and you you're start animation and the character still has to you know, put their foot on the right places in the ground. So uh, you have to watch your ground contacts uh, at all times. Um, and this pro uh, at this time, we also put uh, the cameras from the layout into the set files, um, but we also didn't have a good way to, to keep them up to date. Um, we'll get to that later. <clears throat> we had six different uh, set files, six main set files for the whole film. You can see them listed here, and uh, the like also also the names. And uh, one of the most important one was the riverbed, where like with the pillar, um, um, and 
that was really literally used in almost 80% of the whole film. And the rest of the sets were really just one-offs and things that were constructed out of environment assets for specific shots. Um, at some point, the layout is done. It's never really done, but at some point you have to, like, you have to push production forward. And uh, this is really a crucial step because like, in layout, it's a very organic and messy process. So uh, the stuff that you're creating there needs to be cleaned up for the rest of the production. So uh, I said we have this edit. Uh, we have all the scenes, like all these scene strips in the edit. And uh, at some point, uh, we go in there and, well, I go in there and uh, I place these color strips to you know, mark each individual uh, shot. And then the cool thing is, is that we have the, uh, this attract add-on, which uh, adds the shot to our internal, uh, in, into our cloud database. So we can actually access that from the Blender Cloud and uh, all of Blender Cloud users can do this. So um, this is where we actually get the big picture of how this film is, uh, like, is put together on the shot level. Um, we need to name shots, but we uh, can also see how long each shot is because we get that directly from the frames in the sequencer. And that's really a crucial uh, uh, information for the next step. By the way, how, how are things named? How are scenes and shots named during this film? Um, we had 11 scenes, uh, 10 plus credits. Uh, the scenes uh, were really just given individual names because we, it's a short film. You don't, have, uh, you don't have that many. You don't have to number those scenes. So just as a, as a reminder, we give them interesting names. And th those are usually uh, prefixed with it by a number. Um, on the shot level, it's... Uh, a bit more complicated. So again, we have the scene number, then we have the shot number that we increment by five. Um, why do we do that? It's sometimes easier to add a shot in between if, uh, if you have some space to do things. Um, if this is a bigger production, you might want to increment by 10 or by 100 if you don't know, you know how many shots you're going to add in the middle during this whole process. And then we, uh, we give it uh, a letter at the end for takes, because sometimes we want to do a different version of that shot. In the blend file level, we give the blend files uh, uh, little dot notation uh, appendages uh, to, sig uh, to signal the people like this is what this uh, blend file is, like, this is the task that this blend file is associated with. And these are also put in the shot level of the whole production tree that you saw earlier. Um, once this cleanup is done, you want to do, uh, you, you, you can kickstart animation basically. Usually that's like, it's a very stumbling kind of process because uh, animation also takes a lot of preparation. You know, the rigs need to be done and there's a lot of stuff that needs to be, uh, you know, ready for that time. But uh, you have to put the, the layout into, uh, into a form so you can use it for animation because the animators need some files to work with. They can't start with a layout file, which is incredibly messy. So um, we create a file call, uh, call, called the shot name .anim .blend, and uh, this file links in all the character assets. It links in all the props that are needed for this character, and we link in the, uh, the sets as a background. Um, and this is really the, 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 like the bread and butter what the animator deals with. So how does that look like? Well, we're preparing a blend file, basically. We're, we're starting with a completely empty file, and then we just go uh, uh, file link, and then we link in collections that are in the rest of the production tree. And for the characters, we had, uh, you know, we had collections and rigs in the collections, so we used the old proxy system for that. We had a tool uh, that was a leftover from the agent project, which was kind of a bit icky to get work, to work with uh, Blender 2.8, but um, that helped us also to prepare individual things within the file. But not a lot of was automated, automated there. Then the most important thing is the frame range, so uh, how long the shot is going to be. We get that from a track. We copy paste it from a track into the file, and usually we start the the blend files with uh, frame 101 to give us a nice pre-roll for simulations and that kind of stuff. And we, uh, we also add handles of five frames 
So uh, whenever there's like an edit change or even just, you know, for uh, motion blur glitches, you know, when the character is moving into a shot, you don't want it to be static before the shot star starts. You want to have it, like you want it to have some movement so there is, there is no first frame that looks out of place. Um, then we set up the collections for, for the animators and those get, uh, those get prefixed also with the shots because we might want to link them into other files later on. And uh, this is also where, like, sometimes the animator also makes different collections to, to manage everything. So it's, uh, it's not all set in stone. And uh, then, the, then there's a crucial step, which is putting the camera from the layout into the animation file. Now, we used normal cameras with uh, object animation for the layout, and we had a camera rig for the production because we wanted to have some additional controls and we wanted to use action to animate the camera and we wanted to you know, give it different pivot points. So we had a camera rig that needed to get his information from the layout camera. And as some of you know, uh, armature coordinates and world coordinates are sometimes, uh, they don't really work. So most of the time we just had to hand animate the camera and do our first camera pass at that level. Um, and then, yeah, you just prepare everything for, uh, you know, for setting different vis visibilities. So, um, the sets are usually set up in a way so you can hide certain things so the animator doesn't have to see everything at once. And uh, also some things are just low resolution. So uh, we want to make sure that only the essentials are there for the animator to worry about. Um, then often we, uh, well, most of the time, <laughs> we uh, put a reference shot into the file. So we, I mentioned the, the exports. So we always put the latest exports into the file as a sequence strip, and then we line up the shots with uh, the actual start and end. And so the animator gets some context where they actually actually are in the movie, like the previous shot and the next shot. Then once the animator uh, keeps like doing animation, um, they do uh, viewport renders, and they save them uh, in sequential order in the uh, on our shared server. And uh, this is how the kind of stuff we can critique and we can do notes on. So uh, you're saving the stuff in shots and you're referencing that from the edit. <clears throat> um, a next crucial step is uh, naming the actions. So um, all the actions get prefixed with the shot and then the character it's associated with. While animation is going on, you uh, you can already start doing lighting. And usually during spring, we, uh, we started lighting uh, roughly after the first blocking, so you already get an idea of how the shot is going to look like. So we create a lighting file, and this is also called .lighting.blend, and that links in the character and the props, uh, the sets, but also um, since we're constructing a shot, we're also linking in individual environment assets and changing that environment for spe this specific shot. And uh, there we can, like, we have a clean file, and we can set render defaults, and we can, you know, optimize this file for, for lighting. <clears throat> then the crucial step is that we link the actions from the blend file. You know, we have to make sure that they are named correctly, so whenever the animator updates something, we get that change in the lighting file as well. So we're linking the actions from the animation file into the lighting file. Uh, and you can see that here, like you can't touch all that stuff. Uh, it's still left to the animator. So while you're doing lighting, you get the latest updates from the animator. <clears throat> and then, of course, uh, we set up different collections for lights to be put at and uh, we, can, we can shuffle things around and we can add more objects and those get put into different collections. The test renders from those, uh, from those lighting files are put into frames and those are also loaded into the edit. While we're doing lighting, we can also do a uh, simulation and usually simulation has to be uh, done after the animation is finished, uh, when you have all the movement in the shot. So we create a simulation file, and the simulation file can be a bit more messy, but it still links the animation from the animation file. And then, of course, we need all the other stuff that we have in the shots before. 
As I said, the file is very messy, so here we can do a lot of things. We can throw objects around and make stuff local partially, which is really cool in the, in the new collection system. Um, you can only get into your file what you need, and also you can make objects local and still keep their mesh data linked. Um, and of course, you have to make objects local in this case if you want to sim uh, influence sim simulation parameters. Um, but since the armatures and the actions are all linked, uh, it's all still kept in sync. Um, there was a lot of simulation during spring, mainly smoke simulation. So um, the smoke caches were really uh, the most, like the, the biggest you know, data we had to push around. So uh, the simulation file puts all the stuff into caches and there's more stuff that gets put into the caches. Like we have some general simulations like for falling branches, for grass, for growing plants. Um, those were cached to Alembic. And uh, you know, all kinds of different things that we need in the background, like generic caches. Um, from the lighting file, we can reference all the data from the caches. So we link everything into the lighting file. Uh, for smoke, it's a, bit, it's a bit complicated because you need the smoke domain, actually. So you append the smoke domain, and you're, then you're loading the VDB caches uh, on top of it. And then you can do lighting and uh, shader tweaks on top of that. There's more simulation for spring. Well, like we had uh, fur simulation, uh, which was a big thing, but we only did it in a number of shots. So uh, we couldn't do it on the entire film. So we just did it in very specific shots where Autumn, the dog, had, uh, you know, had a big moment in front of the camera. And uh, another big thing was particle simulation. Um, particle effects were handled a little bit differently on the linking side. We, we didn't cache them to, uh, to file caches per se. They were cached within the blend file uh, as, as Blender particle data. So what we would do is we reference that data in, in the form of collections uh, from the lighting file. So the lighting file links in the collections from the simulation file with all the particle animations in it. So here you can see uh, like all the pebbles. They were simulated in the sim file, and that whole collection was just linked in. And that means that every time we update the simulation, we also get all the new data in. Uh, finally, um, we can do some rendering. Uh, now, this is final rendering, of course, because during the whole lighting process, we're, we're doing uh, rendering all the time. We're tweaking things. And at some point, you can do the final thing with, the, well, with all, the, you know, all the samples in the world. So <laughs> what are the settings for it? We rendered everything to 2K, and we outputted that render as multilayer EXR, 32 bits. Uh, why did we do that? I'll get to that later. We used uh, 2,000 samples plus. Uh, sometimes we used 4,000 samples, sometimes we used 6,000 samples in some shots, which were incredibly noisy during, uh, for smoke. Um, we limited the number of bounces to two or three, and uh, we uh, used motion blur as well, which was incredibly time-consuming but crucial for the animation to work. So these are the settings that we use generally in all the shots. Of course, they vary a bit. Um, and then we used uh, Cryptomat, which was really, really, uh, really imp uh, important and very handy. And we denoised uh, also. We uh, put in all the denoising passes into the multilayer XR, so we could uh, we had the noisy image and the denoised image always in the in the XR output. And those XRs get uh, you know very big, and they are saved from the render farm uh, into the shots directory. Um, why did we use multilayer XR? Well, we did some, uh, we did some cool tricks uh, using sample merging, which uh, is a process where you can render a, a chunk of samples on the farm, and then you get it back. It might be 10 samples, and you see, OK, the shot is OK. There is no ping textures. Uh, let's go it. So we render it with an offset, and we render more samples on top of that. And then what we can do uh, on the farm is just merge that together. And this is actually what Flamenco, uh, the thing that Cyprian made, uh, supports, which is super cool, because uh, you get a really quick version at the start, and then you can add more uh, as time allows it. Then, of course, we did uh, denoising. And the denoising we did actually in post, uh, because we, we had to do all the sample merging, so we can do only the denoising after the fact. So we had all the denoise passes, and we used the, this uh, handy operator in, in Blender to you know, denoise the individual frames and override them. So here we get the denoised image. 
uh, once we have the frames, the denoised frames, the clean plates and everything, we do some compositing on top of that. So, uh, and sometimes also fixes. So uh, we create a compositing file, and this file is usually separated from the rest of the whole production. It doesn't link in any animation. And we uh, link in the data from shots into that file. So you get frame sequences that are loaded into a compositing setup. And in this compositing setup, we can do a number of cool things that are specific to that individual shot. So I mentioned cryptomat, so we can uh, you know, access all the objects and do adjustments based on that. What kind of adjustments? Well, uh, for example, we had Autumn, which was a black dog in a black forest. Uh, we had some problems making him visible, actually. So what we could do with uh, custom animated masks and cryptomat is actually do some color correction, like some brightness changes on top of it. Of course, we didn't do a lot of color correction in the compositing because we didn't want to deviate it. Uh, um, so we, we did uh, grading at the end of everything. But I'll get to that. Uh, also, what we did is uh, render fixes, <laughs> a lot of render fixes. So we, uh, we had to border render a lot of stuff on the farm that had to get fixed. For example, Autumn got, uh, um, got first simulation during the middle, uh, like after the shot was actually rendered. So we had to comp him in with the new, uh, with the new simulation on top of it. So we used Cryptomat, and here you can see custom animated masks, just frame by framing, to put, uh, to put the dog into the shot with the actual simulation. <laughs> um, and then we did other things, uh, lots of other things. Like, for example, we had these glitches all over the place where particles were floating around. And then we did some, did some custom masking and, uh, you know, to hide, hide our crimes after the fact. Um, then also what happened in compositing was uh, adding plates, uh, most notably for, for fog breath. And uh, we rendered out these plates uh, uh, with smoke simulation, and we rendered them out in Eevee because that was super quick. It's only like a little thing that was added on top, so it wasn't crucial for any you know, light uh, interaction with the scene. And uh, we put those plates in the plates directory, and we referenced them uh, from the compositing file as well. So you can see they're just a number of image strips, and they get some color correction, and then they get some translation on top of them to place them in the right point, and then they're just added on top of everything. A um, number of other things get added in compositing. We had vignetting, we had uh, lens flares, we had uh, some um, uh, chromatic aberration uh, on top of everything, very, very subtle, um, which was just basically a, a, a RGBA uh, separation with uh, some translation happening. And uh, yeah, we output that compositing, uh, this compositing sequence into, uh, uh, into the server and uh, we save that as 16-bit EXR files, usually to you know to save some some space, but also we don't need all that uh, that multi-layer data later on. So 16-bit EXRs, we put them in shots, and we can uh, do grading based on that. And the grading was actually done uh, in the edit and uh, reading the data from shots. So. Here you can see the, the film with the grading on top of it. So we did all the grading in adjustment layers. And uh, the, the, there was usually just um, you know, some color, like some small color corrections to get shots like color-wise to line them up each, uh, with each other. And that was done in, in adjustment layers in the edit of the film, loading all the 16-bit EXRs, which were linear, by the way, and the edit was all in filmic. Um, we also did some other grading, like some generalized film uh, effect, if you can call it. It's, it just makes it a little bit more filmic, like to add some warmth to the highlights and uh, make the shadows a bit more contrasty. Uh, yeah. Then we also added some sort of film grain on top of everything because you know we had uh, we had denoising, we had uh, real noise, and we just wanted to you know put everything a little bit together. So we put some we rendered some noise plates and we put it really really subtly on top of everything just to you know mash everything together and make it feel organic. Uh, and then we can output the film as uh, you know for further processing, and we do that as a TIFF sequence. It's actually 12. Uh, it's actually 16-bit, not 12-bit. That's an error there. So we output everything to 16-bit TIFF. You can see 16, yes, and uh, that also gets put on the server. And from those 16-bit TIFFs, we can actually process them um, and, you know, render out the film using FFmpeg and put it on YouTube. 
And uh, we also put all the data of the film on the Blender Cloud, uh, all the characters and uh, all the assets for the, for, for the film. And we packaged some of the shots that you can see on the cloud. And uh, yeah, we put everything together in April. And that's <laughs> where we are at the end. I think I'm a bit over time. I'm sorry for that. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for our great team to you know, make all this possible. Like, this is not my own work. Like, I'm presenting the work from other people. So a big round of applause for them. <clears throat> and yeah, thanks to all the people who watched the film and, uh, you know, all the three million people on YouTube. And thank you for watching this presentation. Have a nice day. Yeah.